Hey guys, thanks for checking out the My Career Path podcast. Today, I have another awesome guest talking about his career as a veterinarian. And I think as a kid, most of us thought we wanted to be a veterinarian because who doesn't like working with pets, taking care of them, making sure that they're okay. So he talks about all the different careers and jobs that he's held throughout his life and how he worked to become a veterinarian, working on various animals all the way up to a tiger. So let's get into it. All right, everybody, welcome to the My Career Path podcast. I have another very special guest with me today, Richard Reeves. Rich, how are you doing? Good, good. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm glad to have you on the show to talk about your life and your career. Yeah, it's it's good to be here. I um, I, I have uh, a career that a lot of people say they want to do when they get older. Uh, That's and right. I made it, Yours so. is one of the most popular careers for kids and whatnot to say that they want to be when they grow up. Yeah. So go ahead and tell everybody what, what your career is. What do you do? So I'm a veterinarian. Um, I, uh, I've uh, kind of wanted to, from the time I was a little kid, like you mentioned, um, wanted to be a veterinarian. I've always been interested and kind of fascinated with animals. And uh, so it was uh, something that I kind of always had in the back of my mind, kind of thought about a few different careers, but uh, ended up pursuing this. And, and uh, here I am. How long have you been a veterinarian? So I graduated from veterinary school in 2009. Uh, so I'm coming up on 15 years now. And wow. uh, it's it's been a really great career. It's been uh, exciting, uh, unpredictable, uh, and uh, really rewarding. That's awesome. I mean, congratulations. 15 years is, is amazing. I can't even fathom. I mean, I've been working for, I don't know, seven or eight years now. And it's just like, wow, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so go ahead and tell us about kind of all the careers you've had in your life. What led you to becoming a veterinarian? What was probably the very first job you ever had? <laughs> My career path has been kind of all over the place. Um, I I don't know if you want me to go through all the jobs that I've had because it's been a oh, lot. I do. <laughs> I, I want to. Yeah, let's let's go through. Well, my very first job, my very first job when I was 16, I worked at a wholesale nursery. So like potting plants, pulling weeds. Uh, people would, would, uh, we would get orders from our boss and we'd have to just go around. It was, it was like a five acre yard that we would have to, uh, you know, maintain all the plants huh. that were there. And, uh, it was, it was uh, a paycheck for me really at the time. I didn't have any interest in doing that long term, but it was a real steady job, really straightforward. And it fit well with my schedule. And I did that for about a year. Mm -hmm. Um, I, uh, I, I had a variety of different jobs leading up to veterinary school. I worked, uh, in a bakery. Um, I worked as a screen printer making t-shirts. Um, I worked as a security guard. I worked in construction. I worked, uh, yeah. In, in, uh, as I got closer to veterinary school, I, I did, I got a job at PetSmart. That was kind of my first job where I was working with animals. Mm -hmm. Um, and then uh, after that, I worked in a research laboratory uh, on campus where I was going to school. So um, it, uh, while I knew that job was going to be helpful for me to get into veterinary school, it was also convenience. Uh, I, I really liked being able to just go up to campus once and I would go to school. I'd go to work when I finished with school and then uh, I would uh, just and go home done. in the evening yeah. and be done. Um, all of those things were kind of leading up to school. I did work in an anatomy lab while I was in school. Um, I, I was involved in a handful of different research projects. And so for a year, I was kind of a, a research assistant uh, and got a stipend for that. And then uh, after graduating from veterinary school, I worked uh, in a mixed animal. Well, the first job that I got out of veterinary school was at my internship. Mm -hmm. um, an internship is kind of like a optional thing that you can do after completing veterinary school. Okay. It just kind of, it gives you a, an additional year to have some mentorship and uh, kind of some additional guidance and instruction. Uh, I did that at a large animal practice in Salt Lake City. Uh, after that year, I worked down in uh, the Phoenix area in a mixed animal practice. From there, I went to another uh, practice, a small animal practice. And then about six years ago, left there, came here to my current uh, uh, practice where I've been, uh, and uh, now I'm the, a partner, uh, uh, an owner of the practice. So 
Awesome. You know, again, from working at the bakery, frosting cakes and, and, uh, pulling weeds all the way to, uh, you know, ownership of a, a owning bakery. your own practice. Yeah. Owning a, being a partner in a practice. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, it's been a long road. <laughs> so for veterinary school, do you have to get like a bachelor's degree or an associate degree before you go into that? How does that kind of work? Well, it's, uh, it's not required, but it takes about, so, uh, like most of the medical schools out there, um, den dental school, med school, you have a number of prerequisites that have to be fulfilled before you can apply to, uh, go to the medical school and veterinary school is the same way. There's, you have to fulfill a number of core biology and, mm -hmm. and chemistry and, uh, physics classes and, um, by the time you've fulfilled all of those requirements, you're about three years in. And so most students will go ahead and do the additional uh, uh, general education requirements along the way and just fulfill their four-year degree so that they've got a degree when they finish. Gotcha. I, I know a handful of people that uh, did a three-year track they just did their prerequisites and went straight into veterinary school. It's mm -hmm. very doable. It's pretty grueling because, you know, you don't have any uh, social studies courses or art classes. It's all basic sciences and yeah. uh, high level science courses and math courses. And so it's pretty intense to do that three year study. But most students will get a, a four year degree prior to going to veterinary school. Gotcha. And do you have to apply to veterinary school and kind of get accepted and whatnot as well? Yeah, that's a pretty, um, it's a pretty intensive process that um, is very competitive. Hmm. The, uh, I don't know the exact st statistics today, but at the time that I was applying for veterinary school, um, for every uh, six applicants, one would be accepted into veterinary really? school. And that was pretty wow. consistent across the country. Um, it, uh, it, it probably ebbs and flows a little bit depending on which school you're looking at, mm -hmm. but, and, and that's just of those who apply, right? The there's, you do have to fulfill all the course requirements, but there's also like GPA requirements and, uh, um, work in the veterinary field requirements that have to be met, uh, for your application. So most students um, at the beginning of their senior year of undergraduate will put together their application. Again, when I did this, it was all on paper and you had to handwrite all of your essays and get all of your letters of recommendation. <laughs> now that's all digital. Mm -hmm. So you get all of your information together. You submit all of that. There's a governing body here in the U.S. that that looks through all of those uh, documents and the requirements to make sure that everything is set. And then basically you just click the boxes of which schools you want to apply to. Huh. Um, there's about, uh, there's about 30 schools in the U S there's a couple others that are, um, outside of the U S that are also like accredited for, you know, U S students to go to. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, so they're kind of all over the country. There's a handful of states that don't have a veterinary school, um, but uh, there's a number even that I know of that are kind of in the works here in the wow. U.S. So it's a very not it's a grueling process to kind of get all your prerequisites and kind of go through all of that, and then you also have to apply and kind of get accepted again to another you know accredited university or education system uh, yeah. after your degree. Kind of wow. So you you put all your application together and then you, you send out all those applications and then they send back letters that basically say you get an interview. Mm. <laughs> so you don't so even, even then you're not done. saying you made it. I mean, there are probably some students, if you have like a very stellar academic career, your chances you're of getting in are going to be higher because they want uh -huh. those top tier students in any program. But everybody still has to come and interview. So you go through an interview process after submitting all of your applications where you'll sit down with a few faculty members and they ask you a handful of questions about your career goals and your experiences from the past and what kind of brought you to the point at which you're applying for vet school. And then you get to wait even another couple of months till you finally find out if you've been picked, which, wow. um, I was pretty eager to 
kind of get on with life by this point in, mm -hmm. in my journey. You know, I had finished my four year. Well, I was again about a semester away from graduating from college and I had been interviewed at only, I had applied at four different schools. I only was uh, interviewed at one school and uh, I finally heard back from them saying I'd been accepted, but I had already decided if I had not been accepted, I was going to go do something else. Uh, that I was, was going to move on. That was way. Yeah, that was me. There are a lot huh. of people who will apply numerous times. The application process only happens once a year. So if you don't oh. get accepted, you have to wait a whole nother year. And, Jeez. um, at the time I applied, I was married and had one child. And so I was just kind of, I didn't pressures of life were starting to get to you. <laughs> yeah. I didn't want to sit around much longer. So I was pretty eager to, to start doing something with my life other wow. than school. Yeah. That's a lot that kind of goes into that. What do you think has been the biggest influence in you deciding to become a veterinarian? You know, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, when I was a kid there, one of my parents, good friends was a veterinarian. His name's Russ Corbett. Great guy. He's, he probably retired, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago or so. And, uh, he ran a very successful practice down in Southern California. And as often as I wanted to come by the clinic, he was always kind of welcoming. And I, I would just show up and kind of shadow him for like an entire summer. I did that just following him around and asking him questions. And, and I remember one, one time, uh, before getting into vet school, calling him, you know, it was like late on a weekend and I was struggling to get through physics or, organic chemistry, <laughs> one of my undergraduate courses. Classic was, OCHEM. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, Russ, I can't do this anymore. I I'm just, <laughs> I'm dying here. And, and he just, you know, tried to reassure me that everything's going to be okay and keep going, keep working hard. You'll get it. And, and sure enough, you know, I, uh, I did. Um, the other, the other person that I'd say was instrumental for me was my wife, Nikki. She, uh, she has put in as many long hours as I have in late nights, trying to help me study for exams, um, supporting me when we were trying to live on a student budget, you know, just yeah. not making any money, trying to raise a young family and, and has always been a real, uh, positive influence on me to, to keep working hard and keep trying. Well, that's awesome. It's awesome to have those people and influences in your life. And I think it's, it's critical to have those relationships. I, I really do, especially for anyone looking at any career, knowing people that are successful, that can kind of help you, inspire you to keep going. I think that's super important. Yeah, I think with Russ, you know, I was able to kind of see to a degree, see myself in him, see what he was doing and, and say, yeah, this is possible. Um, mm -hmm. I, I can see myself stepping into this role. And um, so, yeah, I, I agree with you completely on that. Awesome. What does kind of a normal day look like for you? Like what was your day to day looking like as a veterinarian? Yeah. Owner of a practice. Um, what was that? As a, as a partner of a practice. Oh, know, what does yeah. that look like? Yeah. Um, as a partner, I kind of wear a couple of different hats, but um, maybe first I'll kind of just go through as a general, you know, as a veterinarian, what, what are the, sure. what are the responsibilities that you have? similar to a lot of other medical fields, you know, I work in a, in a small hospital, mm -hmm. it's a private practice. So we make all of our own decisions in house regarding patient care and, and how we run things and how we operate. But I, I probably had on, on an, on an average day, I'll probably see about 10 or 15 different appointments, um, patients that are sick. They've got some medical issue that they're trying to deal with. I'll usually do a handful of surgeries as well. Um, we, we do a, a lot of different diagnostic testing in house in the, in the human medical field. A lot of times it, your doctor says, Oh yeah, you need all these different tests, go somewhere else and they'll get those done for you. Yeah. Uh, in the veterinary clinic, a lot of that is done right there in our own hospital. Um, sometimes we do have to send pets to other places, but we're doing diagnostic testing. We're hmm. interpreting radiographs and looking at blood work and, and, uh, prescribing medications and following up with clients, following up with them to find out how the pets are doing. Right. Um, the, you know, as an, 
as a partner, as an owner, you know, this happened today by chance, uh, you know, my partner says, Hey, uh, do you have a couple minutes? We got to sit down and chat about something. And there's some, um, human resource issue that we need to address, uh, that is, you know, (laughs) somebody's upset with someone else. Somebody said something that someone didn't like, uh, an angry client came in and, and they were, they really want to talk to one of us to kind of resolve this issue. Um, we do have an office manager. So it's it, it, for our management team, sometimes you'll have numerous veterinarians in one practice. Right now, our practice consists of two veterinarians and we have an office manager who helps to take care of a lot of the managerial stuff. The, yeah, they do a lot of the planning, the scheduling. Of running the business that we mm-hmm. don't really want to take care of or, or <laughs> we're not really trained in. Um, but most of my day-to-day is spent talking with clients, um, figuring out what's going on with their pet and then trying to figure out how to fix whatever's going on. Awesome. What do you remember about the training to kind of be a veterinarian, whether that be in the school or just kind of in the field? Yeah. Um, you know, like I mentioned, I finished school almost 15 years ago now. And while I know that the education models have shifted, I, I I talk a little bit with some of the people that are still in veterinary education every day. Mm-hmm. I have a lot of contacts at the university and um, the, there is such a vast amount of stuff that you have to know. <laughs> it's everybody, you know, uses that analogy of trying to drink from a fire hose. Um, there is, there is so much stuff to, to try and know there's no way that you could just memorize all of it. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe there's some people that can do that, but the most <laughs> important thing that I got from veterinary school was learning how to learn, learning how to find out the information that I need. If, if there's a test that I need to run, I might not know exactly what test that is, but if I know how to get that information, I can start investigating how to test for it. Mm-hmm. If there's something that I, um, don't know about kidney function, I know where to go to find that information. If there's something that I don't know about a certain drug that needs to be prescribed, I can go find that information. And so um, it's it's kind of a lifelong learning process. And it starts when you're in veterinary school. As an undergraduate, for the most part, you're gonna be going to a lecture in a variety of different subjects trying to absorb as much information as you can. And then on your tests, repeating back to the professor to show that you've understood the concepts. Once you're in veterinary school, there is still some of that, but a lot more of it is problem-based learning where you're faced with a set of challenges and you have to figure out how to get the answer that you need. Um, And uh, so a lot of it, what I remember most from my veterinary education was a lot of long days and nights, um, but trying to figure out how to learn all the information that I needed to, to know and learn how to find answers when I didn't know the answer to those questions. Well, and I think that's such a critical skill to have. And it, and it honestly kind of gives me a little bit of hope because (laughs) as, as a college student and kind of graduating and whatnot, you kind of go, man, do I have to know all of these things? Like, do I have to have this all memorized? And the, the, the short answer is no, but the longer answer is you need to be able to identify what you need to know and how to find that answer, whether it be if someone else has documented it, or if you know certain processes that'll get you to that answer. Um, I think that's very, very hopeful for a lot of students going, I have to memorize all of this. That's, there's just too much, whether it be for medical or accounting or or any degree, really, there's a lot of it that comes from, you know, learning how to learn, learning how to be adaptable. Yeah. Being adaptable, being flexible. Um, I remember I, like I mentioned, I did an internship after I finished my veterinary degree and that was another crucial part of my education because Mm -hmm. again, I had a number of mentors who were kind of right there working alongside me on certain cases. And, and I, um, I was fortunate. I felt like I was very well trained and, and the people that I worked with gave me a lot of leeway to do things by myself, 
but there was a lot of things that I was still doing in concert with another veterinarian who had been practicing for 25 years. Right. And so finding a good mentor is probably the other thing that I would say really kind of began around the time that I was coming out of veterinary school. Um, for many, many years in the veterinary field, it was kind of expected that you kind of like pay your dues and, and, uh, you know, in quotations, pay your dues, go get yourself in trouble and figure it out on your own how to solve the problem. Right. And then, uh, and then once you've gone through that, we'll kind of accept you into the club and, and treat you like a peer or an equal. Mm -hmm. And that has changed so dramatically, um, so much more so now, um, the veterinary educators especially are recognizing and the veterinary students come out of school saying, I want someone who's going to help me launch into this career and not just drag me through the coals of the fire. Yeah. Um, and, and, uh, so that it's, that's an interesting part of that education that really comes once you're out of veterinary school, mm -hmm. you do have to learn a whole lot of basics. Um, and then you get into practice and you start kind of funneling down all of the stuff that you've had to try and learn over the last four years into the practical application of all those principles. Right. Um, I had somebody ask me the other day about, you know, what are you thinking about when you're in the exam room and a pet has a certain problem? This was a student that was visiting our practice and shadowing. Mm -hmm. And, and I said, you know, the reality is I'm thinking about at least five different things. <laughs> I'm thinking about the history of the pet, everything that I know about the pet leading up to this point. I'm thinking about all the things that the owner has just described to me that the pet's doing uh, that might be out of the ordinary. I'm thinking about what potential tests we need to be running. I'm thinking about what time of day it is and how we can get these tests done and run efficiently so that we can get into our next appointment. And, and there might be a few other things that I'm also thinking about at the same time, trying to figure out, okay, what is the best way that we can provide the best medical care for this patient? And again, it's like funnel all of that stuff down into a succinct uh, conversation with an owner to, right. to, to move forward with the case. And, and as a young veterinary graduate, that, pro that takes time to learn how to do that and, and be able to filter out things that are not important details and, and hone in on those important details. And that somewhat just comes from doing it, but that's probably similar in many careers. You get out you're actually doing it and you go, okay, this really applies. This is important. I got to focus on this. Yeah. And I think a lot of the times people learn the jobs by doing the job and kind of <laughs> going back to what you said earlier, where um, in the later stages of veterinary school and, and school in general, where you have a lot more of here is the problem, go find the solution, you know, and it doesn't yeah. mean that there's a, there's a set way to get there, but you need to be able to kind of figure that out, work, work through it and, and be able to walk people through it. Cause I'm sure, especially in your line of work, um, when the owners come in, I mean, they're, they're scared just as much as the pet is I'm sure. And, and you having to kind of calm them down or walk through whatever, whatever problem may be. Um, it's definitely a skill I think you have to learn. Yeah, it, that is a, that is a, a big skill The client communication is probably one of the most important things of what I do. Mm -hmm. um, I could be the best doctor in the world. I could be the best at, at diagnosing things. I could be the best at doing surgery. But if I can't describe to the pet's owner why I want to do the things that I want to do, they'll never come back or they'll yeah. never agree <laughs> to the treatment um, because they don't understand what's going on with the pet. And so um, that was something that was interesting. I remember from veterinary school, um, early, early in the period that I was in vet school, we were having a discussion with the entire class. And it, there was the question was something along the lines of like, what, what brought you here to this mm -hmm. point? 
And so many people said, I just love animals and I knew I had to work with animals. And so I had to become a vet. And, uh, while I had a part of that as well, um, after having practiced for 15 years, while I still enjoy working with animals and I still fascinated with the different nuances and things that we see, um, one of the most rewarding parts of what I do is the connections with people, the relationships that I have formed with people surrounding the care of their pets. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so I've become a much better communicator over the years. Yeah. And, and that's again, probably the most rewarding part of my career. The pets come and, and they go, their lifespans are not near as long as ours, right. but I might have one owner who comes in with a half dozen different patients during the time that I have them as a client. And, uh, so being able to talk with and get along with people is a critical part of what we do. Yeah. Well, and I think also it's people are what make careers careers. I mean, whatever, whatever you're going into, whatever you're going to do, you're going to have to be able to interact with people because that's the only way you're going to have a career is whether you're doing something, either making something or doing something for people and being able to communicate is, is difficult. And it's a skill that you have to work at and think on and, um, and, and so I, I, I think that's incredibly rewarding too, that you get to see the happiest as well as probably some of the lowest points for some, for some owners. And you get to, you yeah. get to be there for that. Yeah, that is true. Um, that kind of brings up a topic that a lot of people, um, don't like to talk about, but we are there. Some of the greatest and most rewarding, not most rewarding, but like kind of funnest parts are when someone comes in with a new pet, a new yeah. puppy, a new kitten, something that they've just acquired and, and they're so excited about them and they're young and healthy and everything yeah. is kind of great at that point. Um, we're also there at the very end when, uh, pets get older and, uh, their quality of life is declining. And, and that is definitely, I think the hardest part of my job, um, it's, um, having to put animals down is, one of the things that drives a lot of people away from veterinary medicine. Um, I have found it to be a very, um, very unique experience and it's different with every person that comes in and every pet that ends up having to be put down in, in every case that I can think of, there are probably some examples that are, don't fit this, uh, description, but in every case that I have experienced, this has been a situation where we know that this pet is suffering mm -hmm. and to be able to relieve that suffering is important. It's important yeah. for the pet and it's also important for the owner to know that this pet who they love and care for is not having to suffer. They call it the bitter end for a reason. It's, yeah. it's pretty terrible. Uh, for some pets as they get older and they have numerous problems come, you know, kind of piled on top of each other. And so it's a very, um, it provides so much closure for people. And, uh, and as, as difficult as that is, and as many people that are crying and as many times as I've been in an exam room crying with an owner, uh, I probably have more people who bring cookies by the office to thank our staff after that has occurred than at any other time in their pet's life. And it's because we've been able to help provide an environment where that process has been as comfortable as it can be. And, yeah. uh, it's as hard as that is, that is also another, um, somewhat reward rewarding part of my career that, uh, I am in there to kind of help people get through that really difficult decision and difficult point in their pet's life. Yeah. And I, and I imagine that that's, it's, it's a roller coaster of emotions, you know, and, and yeah. I don't know if I'll ever have to do that for anybody, but I, I remember when our dog passed away and, um, it, it's hard, it's tough, but it's also, you know, to have people like you and people who are look out for them and take care of them the best they can, but also have the honesty to say, you know what, it's, it's time and, uh, yeah. to kind of work through that. So I, I really appreciate people who, 
who do that. I mean, that's, it's the same with medical doctors for human doctors as well, where it's, there's, there's both sides. Um, so I, I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. Um, yeah, not a problem. What, what do you think is probably the best advice you could give to someone looking to become a veterinarian? Yeah, that's a good question too. Um, the best advice, you know, your studies, there is so much that goes into preparing to go to veterinary school. Um, academically, you do have to have good grades. And so really applying yourself in the basic science courses, biology, chemistry, mathematics, um, all of those are, again, kind of the foundation for you to be able to get into veterinary school and really understand the concepts. And so both during high school and during your undergraduate years, um, really applying yourself and trying to learn those concepts is, is critical. Um, uh, getting experience in the veterinary field um, is always going to be helpful. Um, sometimes that is your cue or you recognize that 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 this career is not for you. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and, that might be your sign to like, all right. <laughs> excuse me. Um, yeah, there's, we have a lot of students that come to our hospital and volunteer for us. And, and there have been a handful that they come and they've been with us for a day and they kind of go, you know what, I'm, I'm really grateful that you let me come, but I know that this is not for me and that's okay. Yeah. Um, so, you know, asking for those opportunities, uh, as you get a little bit older, you typically have to be about 18 to volunteer in a medical clinic of any kind. Some, there might be some, you know, caveats to that or some exceptions, but, right. um, but, uh, volunteering, shadowing, following the doctor around, kind of seeing what their day is like. <laughs> um, there was something else that came to mind and now it's kind of slipped my mind. Um, Oh, I can't think of it now. Maybe, oh, so it'll, come I, maybe, maybe it'll come back later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's great. I think just making sure that you're getting experience and I think trying it out. I think a lot of people look at that, look at veterinary and becoming a veterinarian as, as a very good career, as a potential career where you get to work with pets and people and, and enjoy that. And so I think figuring that out is, is a great idea. Um, what do you think, what are the traits that stand out to you and the people that you work with? So if someone were to apply to your practice, um, what, what's something that would stand out to you that would make you go, okay, maybe I want to hire this person. Um, you know, the, um, the ability to learn new things, uh, is critical. If somebody came out of school and was like, I don't know how to do this surgery. I don't know how to do that surgery. I don't know how to do this test. I don't know how to do that test. Like I can teach you how to do all those things. Mm -hmm. Um, a willingness to learn is, is probably at the top of the list. Um, being able to find a way to overcome, maybe it's shame or fear of saying, I don't know how to do this. I've never done this before. Um, we see that in our field all the time. I mean, whether it's my assistants or my technicians who are helping me get work done or new veterinarians coming out of school and, and there is not, like I said, I think that this dynamic has changed in the last 20 years. Um, there is not any requirement for someone to come out of school knowing how to do everything that we do. Right. Um, having a good attitude is probably also right up there with a willingness to learn. Um, whether you're working with staff whether you're working with other doctors, whether you're working with specialists at other hospitals, clients, angry clients, um, <laughs> or just other members of your community. Again, communication is paramount and, and your ability to, to get through some of those difficult conversations that have to be made, um, explaining to someone that to, to fix things that it's going to cost a thousand dollars or $10,000 to go have this surgery done. Yeah. Um, these are conversations that occasionally you get to have as a veterinarian. <laughs> and so having a, a good, uh, set of communication skills is really helpful. And, um, um, that, that can be sometimes kind of paralyzing people get into these situations and go, Oh, I don't know how to tell somebody that this is what we need to do. And, and, uh, 
Um, I don't know of a good way to practice that necessarily. Yeah. <laughs> but having some good communication skills, absolutely. A willingness to learn. Um, and uh, those those would probably be my top two for sure. Awesome. Awesome. I, I really appreciate that. Um, yeah. Well, I, so I, I really appreciate you coming on the show to, to talk about your experiences, to share what it's like to be a veterinarian. Um, yeah. I, I do have a couple of, of maybe odd questions for you, and I'm hoping they're, okay. they're a little humorous. What, yeah, what has been it. kind of the weirdest patient that you've seen, whether it be a, a, a strange Ooh. animal or a strange case? Yeah. <laughs> um, so not the place where I'm practicing now, but my last job, uh, I was working at a... Uh, hospital that was right next door to a large equestrian facility. So it was like a big riding arena and they'd have okay. rodeos there and all sorts of different things. And, and our clinic was about a quarter mile from this place. Not even that, maybe an eighth of a mile. It was really uh -huh. quite close. We're just going about our day like normal. And a guy walks in through the front door and says, Hey, could you guys look at a tiger for me? And all of us were kind of like, is this guy, he's just talking about a really angry cat. Like what, what is going on here? Yeah. <laughs> but sure enough, there was a traveling circus that was next door at the riding arena. That's awesome. And, uh, this, this tiger had, had been on the road for about three or four months and it was really, really sick. It had a really bad skin condition. Okay. And our hospital was set up that we kind of had an area in the back that we could literally pull a, a truck into the back of the hospital. So we knew we could get the tiger inside. He had kind of a, a cage that they would travel in that he it was on wheels and he could bring the tiger over. But I mean, my boss, the first thing out of his mouth was absolutely not, no way he's going to have to go somewhere else. And I said, wait, 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 before you, because the receptionist of course had come back, like eyes, you know, almost going to pop out of her head. Like this guy wants to bring like an actual tiger in the hospital. But, uh, um, I, I just said, when's the next time someone's going to ask you if you want to look at their tiger, like we can at least look at it. Right. I mean, exactly. there's nothing, we can at least give it a chance, we can at least look at it. Uh, <laughs> as a veterinarian, when you graduate from veterinary school, you can go on to pursue a specialty in zoo animal medicine, if you wanted, or exotic animal medicine. But there is nothing that keeps you from seeing any patient for any reason. Really? And so with my veterinary license, I was totally within the scope of reason for me to say, yeah, bring the tiger over. Let me take a look at it and see what we can do. And, and so sure enough, that's what we did. We had him bring this tiger over and, um, we had to restrain the tiger, which was interesting. Uh, the, you oh, know, I'm those sure. animals, you kind of think, oh yeah, they're just like real they're real friendly cats, but they are not, they are wild animals and they behave for the trainer. And that's about it. Um, oh, we had to very, very cautiously get a blood sample and send it out for some testing. And we ended up treating the tiger for a couple of weeks and, and, uh, it did actually make a full recovery. Uh, we kept in touch with the guy cause he went back to the Midwest somewhere where they were from. And, yeah. and, uh, it was a really, Kind of a crazy case. That's like a once that's in a cool. lifetime. Kind of <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Going to come in and ask me if I want to look at their tiger, but you know, <laughs> we have people call all the time. We're a small animal hospital, so we primarily see dogs and cats, mm -hmm. but we have people come in all the time with snakes and lizards and birds and uh, all sorts of other pets that they've acquired and are now <laughs> sick, and they want to see if there's something we can do to help. Wow. Um, yeah, I've had a variety of, of odd cases, lots of broken bones, lots of skin disease, lots of diarrhea. Uh, <laughs> um, it's, uh, it, it's interesting. I, I feel like over my career, that's been, there's kind of like a, a core expectation of different cases that I'll see in any given week. And then there's always something that comes up that's like, oh, I didn't expect this. You know, somebody yeah. <laughs> schedules appointment for their dog named Jerry and they show up and it's a goat and it only has three legs. And <laughs> Natu yeah. Naturally. Thinking, how, how did we get this far? And we didn't know this was a goat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah it, it's just things like that That's pop awesome. up every once in a while. And uh, so it's been a, it's been a really fun career. Um, we do continuing education all the time. So every year we were required to do some continuing education. And so we go to conferences and, 
learn about the most recent advances in veterinary medicine and veterinary care. And wow, that's cool. so it kind of helps keep you up to date on the new things that are going on and network with other students or not students, yeah. other professionals, yeah, and other veterinarians and other doctors other veterinarians and things like and, that. Yeah. Yeah. So there you have it, guys. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope you're able to learn something about Rich's career, about his time as a veterinarian, all the schooling, all the hard work that kind of went into it. And hopefully you laughed about the different experiences that he's had along his journey, but also realizing that being a vet is really hard work. If you did like this episode, make sure to leave a like and subscribe and let me know what careers you guys are interested in. I'd love to get people on the show to talk about their careers, how they got to the spot they were at to hopefully help you figure out what you want to do. Until next time, catch you guys later.